Eğer ki. Eğer ki. Hayatımızda hiç eğer olmasaydı nasıl olur? Size şöyle söyleyeyim. Her şey daha az parlak, daha az yeşil olur. Ve daha az parlak yeşil. Çünkü eğerler ormanların derinliklerinde tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşler. Eğerler Nobel ve Guggenheim'ın aklına takılır. Ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırarlar. Asla yalnız yürümezler ve aşırı bulaşıcıdırlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler günü umursamazlar, robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıla dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, session 5. This session is about uh, earthquake, geotechnical engineering and associated problems. Uh, I am your session chair Kartal Toker from uh, Middle East Technical University in Ankara. Uh, so uh, hopefully we are going to see uh, very interesting presentations today uh, and uh, after approximately 10 minutes of each presentation uh, after all of them are complete we are going to have a uh, question answer session and discussion as well uh, so without further ado let's uh, start so our uh, first presenter is uh, Andreas Nizar Granitzer uh, from Graz University of Technology in Austria uh, so hello Mr. Toka hello Please, uh, please go ahead and uh, you okay. may start. Uh, before I start, um, I want to thank you in advance for your understanding that I will may take that it will may take two or three minutes longer, but will, I will hurry up. Thank okay. you. Okay. So now I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um. Uh, Thank you for your introduction, Mr. Toker, and good afternoon from Graz in Austria, or in the words um, of Dr. Mark Balouch during his yesterday's opening speech, good afternoon to the geotechnical family. Um, my name is Andreas Granitzer, and together with Professor Chuchnik, we feel honored to be selected as first contribution to this session, which will mainly deal with earthquake engineering and dynamic loading. As far as I understood from yesterday's opening speech of President Ersin Tata, Northern Cyprus is considerably susceptible to this topic. Hence, uh, effective strategies are in demand to prevent chaos and catastrophes arising from dynamic excitation. In this context, the following minutes will be devoted to two powerful instruments for the design and prediction of the structural performance during dynamic loading events that geotechnical engineers should definitely include in their toolbox, namely uh, numerical mathematics and emitted beam formulations. As a starting point, we need to consider the origin and the time discrete development of the kinematic quantities, displacement, velocity, and acceleration that are related through their time derivatives. As can be observed from the figure, it is common practice to distinguish between four general types of dynamic loads, namely harmonic, periodic, transient, and uh, impulse type loading. In view of their nature, time bearing loads may, may be also divided into two main categories. Firstly, loads applied directly to structures, such as wave forces or machine loads. And secondly, loads acting on structures through the soil, presumably originating from earthquake loads blast effects or distant vibrating sources. In the following, we will restrict ourselves to the latter. From a geotechnical engineering perspective, the design of pile supported structures has to consider the potential occurrence of these loads, all of a sudden prompting the question 
as um, how to consider dynamic soil pile structure interaction effects. Owing to a rising uh, dynamic soil structure interaction effects, neither the ground motion nor the structure response are independent of each other, but in turn depend on various factors, including the mass of the superstructure, the stiffness of the soil or damping phenomena of the soil pile structure system. Consequently, the analysis of related problems poses a complex task at the interface between uh, geological, structural, geophysical, and geotechnical disciplines. It is well known that when external dynamic forces act on structures, either through the soil or directly on the structures, neither the structure response nor the ground motions are independent of each other owing to dynamic soil structure interaction effects. More specifically, and as shown in the right bottom figure, both inertial loads from vibration of the superstructure and kinematic loads imposed by lateral ground displacements contribute towards structural damage. Hence, they should be cons considered with care during the foundation design. Although relevant design codes such as Eurocode 8 assert the potentially relevant significance of soil pile structure interaction in the design of sens sensitive structures, there is no general guidance on how to assess the influence of dynamic soil pile structure interaction. At present, the prominent type of dynamic analysis procedures is based on numerical and analytical approaches that utilize simplified multi-step methods, also referred to as substructure methods. This type of analysis procedure is based on the general superposition theorem that permits breaking the problem into parts that are subsequently added together. The later include kinematic as well as inertial um, interaction analysis steps, which uh, are, however, only valid for linear or equivalent linear systems. Given the highly nonlinear uh, soil behavior during strong ground motions, this approach, in many cases at least, represents an oversimplification of related physical problems. Moreover, multi-step methods are often carried out under the assumption of a fixed base structure, thereby ignoring the development of dynamic soil pile structure interaction. In the figure, this uh, idealization is denoted as fixed base structure. A more advanced approach uh, accounts for dynamic soil structure interaction um, by means of springs and viscous dashpots. This requires the, the, the beforehand determination of impedance functions that aim at quantifying the combined stiffness and damping behavior of soil foundation systems. However, this step is quite delicate, complex, and thus rarely applied in engineering practice. From the above discussion, or from the before discussion, to be honest, it becomes apparent that multi-step methods in many cases constitute simplified analysis procedures that may lead to unsafe and uneconomic design as they neglect contributions stemming from um, uh, from sources such as soil deformability, material, or radiation damping. As an alternative, single-step methods, which traditionally include a continuum that simulates the soil as a matrix by using the finite element or a finite difference method, provide a more convenient way to simulate the dynamic uh, response of si soil pile structure systems. This is because inertial and kinematic effects are simultaneously modeled. However, they are computationally expensive, thus rarely applied in practice. With regard to single-step methods employing finite elements, the rate of convergence is closely linked to the mesh configuration and in particular to the pile modeling approach. In common practice, there exist two explicit pile modeling strategies. The first strategy, commonly referred to as the standard FE approach, poses fully 3D surface-to-surface -surface mesh tying problems where coupling with the matrix domain is mostly realized by means of zero thickness interface elements or more to FE techniques. Although very accurate, the SFEA gives rise to numerically expensive mesh generation procedures, which limits their applicability to large-scale dynamic problems. Borrowing um, numerical concepts originally developed for the micromechanical analysis of, of reinforced structures, embedded beam formulations have evolved as viable alternative to circumvent meshing constraints of the SFEA in geotechnical finite element analysis. At present, most commercial geotechnical FE codes are endowed with classical embedded beam formulations with 1D interaction line. Recent research at our institute in cooperation with Bentley Systems in the Netherlands has paved the way to the EBI, an extension of the embedded beam. As a key characteristic inherent to, EB, to embedded beams with interaction surface, coupling between beam and solid elements is established through multiple equally spaced coupling points located along the circumference of the corresponding physical beam section, instead along the axis as it is the case for the embedded beam with interaction line. Recent publications have highlighted relative merits of the embedded beam with interaction surface compared to the embedded beam with interaction line. Um, for example, a reduced mesh sensitivity of results. In order to assess the numerical fidelity of both embedded beam formulations and provide insight to the significance of the pile modeling approach in the analysis of pile foundation constructions under dynamic loading, our contribution provides comparative studies of a well-documented dynamic-centered uh, boundary value problem. 
in view of their intended use, it is to capture uh, the behavior of standard FE approach piles. The performance of both MLA beam formulations numer is numerically assessed based on comparisons with the standard FE approach benchmark. Broadly, the boundary value problem under investigation has been subject of numerous previous studies and constitutes a single degree of freedom structure supported by four flexible piles. As shown in the bottom left figure, symmetry conditions are used, which is why only half of the model and two piles have been modeled. In part, the modeling parameters are provided below the figure showing the mesh discretization. Supplementary details, for example, um, well, concerning the boundary conditions can be obtained from our paper. These models have been used to study the dynamic response sensitivity of its behavior under free vibration and dynamic excitation. Key results will, will now be shown on the following slides. In seismic codes involving response spectrum analysis, both the equivalent viscous damping ratio and the natural frequency of the soil structure system represent fundamental ingredients in the evaluation of the maximum spectral acceleration amplitude, and of course, uh, the design-based shear force respectively. The single step method is uh, in combination with free vibration analysis have proved viable to determine both parameters with high accuracy. In the present case, free vibrations are invoked via horizontal excitation forces of different magnitudes that are applied to the concentrated mass. The equivalent viscose damping ratios are obtained from the free decay responses after excitation force release, which are recorded at the position of the concentrated mass. Both figures illustrate the deduced equivalent viscose damping ratios and natural frequencies as a function of the excitation force magnitude from the calculated time history records. Regardless of the pile modeling approach, the viscous damping ratio values increase with excit excitation force magnitude, while the natural frequency values show the, the opposite trend. The validity of these observations has been confirmed by numerous researchers and is mainly attributed to the, to the nonlinear soil characteristics. Next, the dynamic response of the pile structure system is evaluated using widely accepted am amplification ratios. The mass base amplification ratio A underscore M minus B and the mass free field amplification ratio A underscore M minus FF. It is noteworthy to, to, to say that uh, both amplification ratios examined in the bottom right figures incorporate the combined effect of inertial and kinematic interaction. As a consequence, the latter are dominated by natural frequency of the soil and the soil structure system. The maximum steady state response to harmonic excitation develops near the natural frequency of the soil structure system commonly resulting in the, evolution, uh, in the evolution of maximum pile bending moments. If the harmonic excitation frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the soil, amplification ratios are lower due to the dominant role of the soil resonant. It is worth noting that these variation patterns have been observed in experimental tests executed in comparable, uh, comparable pile foundation systems. Related references are given in the paper. In view of the sensitivity studies, the results provide evidence that the pile modeling technique has a notable influence on the kinematic behavior of the structure. While the amplification ratios are similarly damped if the harmonic excitation frequency is greater than the natural frequency of the soil structure system, significant deviations in case the excitation frequency is close to the natural frequency of the soil structure system are observed, presumably due to the different soil pile coupling schemes implemented in the pile modeling technique studied. If the excitation frequency is close to the natural frequency of the soil, all modeling, uh, pile modeling techniques show compliant results, which is attributed to the prevailing soil resonance. So to sum up, this slide concatenates the lessons learned from our conference paper. First, in contrast to multi-step methods, single-step methods, for example, based on finite elements, allow to model inertial and kinematic effects simultaneously. Hence, they give a direct and more realistic estimation of the dynamic response of soil pile structure systems. However, sophisticated pile modeling techniques are in demand to reduce the computational effort to reasonable levels. In this context, emitted beam formulations serve as powerful tool for numerical engineers as they allow for cause mesh discretizations leading to a reduced system of equations derived from the dynamic equation of motion. The presented results underline that using M and beam formulations allow to predict the natural frequency and viscous damping ratios of soil pile structures with high accuracy. This is a crucial finding as both parameters are fundamental ingredients in the evaluation of the maximum spectral uh, acceleration amplitude and the design-based shear force according to Eurocode 8. However, they should be used with care for the prediction of kinematic amplification ratios at excitation frequencies close to the natural frequency of the soil structure system. Looking ahead, future work might concern the validation of MLED beam formulations under transient and impulse type loading. Also, the prediction of stress resultants should be investigated. At this point, I want to thank the organizing committee, the chair and the attendees for your attention. I hope that I will be able to attend the presence for the, uh, in presence for the sixth version of your versatile conference in, in Nicosia. And last but not least, as you might have heard, 
Austria has been selected in Sydney as the host of the 21st uh, International Conference on Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering of the ISMG, uh, which is going to take place um, from June the 14th until June the 19th, 2026 in Austria. Since our institute is involved in the organization of this huge event, you may be interested to in following updates published on our LinkedIn channel. The respective QR code is given in the, in the figure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, uh, unlike your prediction, you were very, uh, very well in time. So you oh. didn't take over time at all. <laughs> so uh, that was very interesting. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, if there are any, I can respond to them via email later on as well. Okay, I, I will have one quick question actually. Uh, so when you look at the embedded beam foundation type of analysis or type of model versus uh, the uh, pile as a solid element and some sort of interface around it, uh, like you showed at a relatively early slide of yours, uh, it feels like the, the one with the uh, interface might model uh, the behavior better if you have larger deformations, but not necessarily if you have smaller deformations. Uh, is, is there a behavioral or is there a performance difference between uh, according to the deformation levels there? I, I would I would in part uh, agree. Um, but you have, of course, to consider that um, obtaining the stress results and such as bending moments, etc., from uh, the standard FE approach is a bit more difficult. So um, you need to find the right balance between, of course, large uh, displacement amplitudes and, of course, also the requirements for your design. But um, you're completely right that in case of large displacements, the standard fee approach is still, of course, superior. OK, I see. OK, thank you very much. And uh, please much. stay on because we might have uh, more questions at the end as well. So uh, OK, with that, uh, let's move on to the next uh, presenter, and that is uh, from Indonesia. But I'm sorry if I uh, butcher your pro name, uh, pro pronunciation of your name here. Togani Kahyadi Upomo from yeah. University of uh, Negari Semarang. You feel free yeah. to <laughs> repeat that <laughs> proper pronunciation, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. My name is. Okay. Uh, should I share? Yes, please go ahead and okay. uh, share your screen. Okay. Well, first, I upload or just uh, share a screen. No, it works by just sharing. If you, it is, oh. I guess, easier with just, just sharing. Click, okay. Share screen and show your presentation. We can just see it. I'm not sure about the technical bits, though. Uh, uh, Miss Betul, do you have any comment on that? Uh, Yeah, go ahead. Just share your screen and we will. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. OK. OK. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor and all, all, and all participants. Uh, my name is Tokani Cahyadi Pomo. I'm from Indonesia, uh, Semarang. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to uh, present regarding the case of the flow site due to soil liquefaction on 2018 in Palu, Indonesia. Uh, in this presentation, I just focus on the subsurface study of flow slide liquefaction in just one location in Petopo, Palu, Indonesia. <coughs> yes, my our my outline is the first introduction and the second is seismicity condition and at uh, during the earthquake site investigation, uh, groundwater monitoring liquefaction evaluation and the conclusion. Uh, as we see, uh, as we know before in the news on September 2018, during Palu Donggala earthquake, it's uh, the magnitude is 7.5 moment magnitude. Uh, there are several locations uh, suffer with a huge flow slide. But in this location, I just uh, we just focus on the Petopo village. In this location, the affected area is approximately 1.64 kilometers square with the slope 
uh, of around three degrees. It's very gentle slope. Uh, Togani, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, can you uh, move this to the presentation mode so that it is full screen instead of having your slides on? Uh, in the PowerPoint, I'm saying, uh, uh, can you move to the full screen mode? Full screen mode? Uh, it, yeah, yeah, the, uh, next to the zoom icon, the, the, the button right left, of, uh, immediately left of the zooming bar at the lower right corner of the PowerPoint screen. Yeah, that one. Oh, okay. Did it work? Let me see. You said uh, full screen? Uh, no, nothing happened. Well, I don't know why not. When you press that, normally it should take the slide to full screen. But... Or, or just I share uh, the PDF, maybe. It's, I think it's better. Uh, I don't know. Can, can you try pre pressing that again? Because that, that's so, supposed to normally make it full screen. Uh, uh, I don't know. Because in my screen, it's, it is full screen. Ah, is it? Interesting. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, and OK. OK. And the location of uh, the potopo is at the dot, uh, pot, dot blue. And uh, the epicenter of the earthquake is uh, and the red star over here and the potopo flow slide area you can see in the right side uh, there are uh, one main road it's called Mohamed Suato road uh, we focus on this road because it it in the middle of the road and we we try to describe uh, the whole area <clears throat> Uh, as uh, says Misty, uh, the Palu City is traveled is by Palu Korofor. This location over here, Palu Korofor. It, uh, which is well known as the Sulawesi most active faults. In the past, several earthquakes, included the 2080 Palu Donggala earthquake, head center or near the fault. Its location of the 2018 is uh, close to the Palu Korofor. Based on the the other. Research, a peak Palo Korofot length is approximately 500 km, kilometers with an estimated slip rate uh, around 34 mm per year. For the 2018 earthquake, uh, the station is called PCI, located in Pal Palu City, Balora, recorded a peak ground acceleration is around 0.34 G. Uh, the site investigation, we conducted Investiga investigation three per hole. Uh, it's called PH1, PH2, and PH3. PH1 is located at the corner area, PH2 in the middle area, and PH3 uh, in the lo location at the two area. We can see the, the soil profile of PH1, PH2, and PH3. At PH1, uh, the soil dominated by uh, sand and gravel. Uh, its interpreted layer, loose soil with uh, n values of approximately, approximately around 8 to 14. And uh, Togani, I, I'm really sorry to interrupt again, but for some reason, uh, the VOVC is stuck at slide four, uh, the one with the map. So, yeah, uh, so we can't see uh, when you move to forward, when you progress forward towards. Uh, Later slides, we, we won't be able to see them right now. So uh, I'm not sure what's wrong here, but. Uh, uh, just like here, like you can see. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, Is it okay? Yeah, let, let, let's try like that. But when you, I think your, do you have something like a double screen or something? Do you have two screens of your uh, uh, computer? Or? Uh, just one screen. I just, anyway, uh, let, let's continue, but we, we have been stuck at slide four uh, while you were talking. I mean, right when you moved on to site investigation and started talking about boreholes, I thought maybe this is, maybe you moved to slide six or something. And okay. We, we didn't. Okay. So uh, anyway, can, can you try pressing that little button again? That one, yeah. Can you press that? Okay. Uh, for the... Uh, okay. 
No, we, 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 we still didn't get that. For, for some reason, that doesn't work. So please uh, use this screen, uh, not the... So right, right now, maybe you have a full screen view, but we don't. So uh, please use the PowerPoint's regular edit okay. screen. And ju just like you did before, zo zoom a little bit and continue from okay. here. Okay, one by one, I will show. Uh, that, that, that's okay. better. Okay. Uh, for the uh, investigation, uh, we have conducted three porthole. PH1, PH2, and PH3. PH1 located uh, uh, at the crown area near the Kumbasa irrigation canal. Uh, it's the blue line over here. And PH2 uh, located at the middle area. And PH3 uh, located in the two area. All of the per hole are uh, uh, near the Muhammad Suharto Road, which uh, divide. Uh, the location into two and the south north part area and the south part area we try to describe the condition of the whole petopo area by the section of the main road at ph1 are dominated with the sand and gravel you can see uh, the uh, the color over here orange and yellow and brown area in the <clears throat> loose sand, loose soil, we have uh, they have uh, n values of approximately eight to fourteen, and found at the top of four meter. Below the four meter, soil become denser with SPT around seven to sixty. Over here, you can see, and the fine contents uh, around one percent to twenty percent. Uh, the higher fan percent are located at the upper area over here. At PH2, uh, at the middle area, uh, located at the middle area here, uh, consists of seal and sand with the fine content around uh, 40 to 70 percent for the 8.5 meter, 8.5 meter over here. And values uh, varies around 3 and 14. The the soil below 8.5 meter below 8.5 meter are sand and gravel. It's uh, similar with pH one, with the n values range from 22 to 25. At pH three, uh, we found that the, at the location is as the pre material at the tool. Uh, at the debris material, we found at the depth of 2.5 meter below the Below the debris material, it below the debris material, uh, to thirty meter deep, soils are dominated with the medium dense sand, and then sealed with fine uh, at the sealed with fine contents <coughs> uh, around forty two to seventy nine percent, and the end values over here is relative low, but uh, around four to twelve. From the table one at the uh, here over here, we we measure the energy measurement for the SPT hammer energy measurement is around uh, fifty nine to seventy five. It's because we we use the manual SPT; it's not automatic, so the ER is varied over here. Uh, from the current water monitoring, we we after the borehole uh, has been done, uh, we monitor the groundwater from 18 March 2020 uh, to 24 March 2021. It's a one year period because we want to know the condition of groundwater during the wet season and the dry season. So. Uh, we want to know because from the other researcher at uh, around the pH one near the Kumbasa Canal, uh, the groundwater is relatively close with the ground surface. But from our monitoring during one year period, the groundwater table uh, dropped to around 12, 12 meter to thirteen meter. Although at pH two and pH three. The groundwater uh, 
relatif near the ground surface. For the liquefaction evaluation, uh, we use the simplified procedure by SID and NCCR or NCCR method because it's commonly used to uh, assess the liquefaction. It's, it's, uh, we use uh, the liquefaction factor of safety, FL, it's for CRR and CSR, I think it's, uh, it's more familiar. For the peak ground acceleration, we use the estimated uh, 0.3 G and the moment magnitude uh, 7.5 uh, moment magnitude. For the <coughs> groundwater table for pH1, we assume uh, the groundwater table depth is 2 meter. But for the pH2 and pH3, uh, the groundwater red water level assume the same level as uh, the ground surface. Uh, oh, sorry. <coughs> for the liquefaction evaluation, we can see the <coughs> at pH1, at pH1, the high potential is located at 6 meter and 11 to 18 meter over here. Our on-site uh, observation at pH, HPH1 uh, did not clearly reveal the symptoms for the liquefaction. However, numerous cracks and down drop ground surface uh, observable on the surface near the pH1. At pH2, uh, the liquefaction estimate uh, occur at depth uh, 6 to 9 meter over here, 6 to 9 meter. Uh, with soil clarification is SW uh, and SM. Based on the surface observation at the surface, uh, flow liquefaction occur in the uh, at the location of pH two. So, uh, so many damage uh, look, uh, at pH two. At pH three, the FS less than one occurs at depth 12 to 15 meter uh, at the near surface over here. I think uh, it's uh, the debris material. So uh, it's uh, the not the liquefied uh, area. Uh, by comparison uh, uh, with the uh, uh, By comparison with the grain size, uh, we can see the, the liquefaction, uh, all of the soil material uh, is uh, liquefied. But from the assessment, uh, from the NCER, uh, just uh, several layers is liquefied. Uh, after, after we analyze the liquefaction and the, the soil profile, we try to uh, speculate uh, the slip surface of the the slope at the main road uh, we connect the 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 slip surface from the crown area because in the location is uh, i think is the starting point and then uh, from the ps2 we can uh, based on our Assessment is uh, the liquefaction around six to nine meters. So we we plot it at the nine meters, and then the at the PS three it's located at the surface. So we can see uh, the speculated uh, slip surface is uh, uh, like in this in this figure. Uh, for the bold red line, bold red line over here is uh, maybe a spring line. Uh, and it's the post slide, black red line here is the post slide, and the black uh, line is indicate the uh, pre slide. So over here is uh, the debris material. Okay. <coughs> uh, for the conclusions, uh, the study is I, I aim to refer the subsurface condition in photopos lighting area. We conducted set investigation, groundwater table monitoring, and laboratory studies testing. Uh, this study, we found that sand, silt, and gravel existed at the site. 
sand and gravel dominated in the ground near irrigation canal. I call it Kumbasa irrigation canal. However, sand and sea are more often in the middle and the two parts. Groundwater table near the ground area would be around 40 meters below the ground surface after the earthquake and without the influence of infiltration by the canal and paddy fields because uh, before the earthquake, the location area is an uh, area of paddy fields. Moreover, groundwater at, mid, at the middle and two parts in the current post-light period are close to the ground surface. The safety factor again liquefaction has been assessed by using SID or NCER method. Uh, at pH1 located near the throne, liquefaction would be more susceptible in layer with depth generally more than 10 meters. But from the on-site observation in the location is uh, it uh, indicate no liquefaction. In the middle area, PS2 would likely be liquefied due to earthquake at a depth of less than 10 meters. At PSD, situated near the two, the liquefaction susceptibility would appear low and relative stable with only few spare depths computed with low safety factor. Okay, uh, this one is the references we using. Uh, and and thank you for the present uh, for this presentation and participation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was interesting, and I'm very sorry for multiple interruptions. Uh, uh, hopefully, I didn't break your concentration too much. Uh, so, okay, let me ask the audience, do we have any uh, questions? Okay, so uh, it seems we don't have any questions. So let's move on to the next presenter. Thank you very much, uh, Togani, first of all. Uh, so the next presenter is Shima Shameki from uh, Özgyen University in Istanbul. So uh, yes, please uh, go ahead and start, Ms. Shima. Hujam, can you see my screen? My presentation slide? Yes, we can. Okay, can I start? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. My name is Shima Shamahi from Azian University in Istanbul, Turkey. I would like to speak about uh, our last study with title a comparison study between 1D and 2D site response analyzers based on observed earthquake acceleration records. Uh, these are our outlines for this presentation at first introduction, then problem statement, then research objective, and 1D and 2D modeling. Then improving shear wave velocity as novelty of this research, and uh, then results and conclusion. Uh, I would like to start with some introductions about some uh, site response analyzers. Site response analyzers is a, a geotechnical engineering procedure for uh, calculate the response of site against an, uh, a ground motion uh, with three uh, important stages, including dynamic site characterization based on the results of the geotechnical site investigation and laboratory testing, selection of rock motion, including artificial or real ground motion, and at the end, site response analyzers and design spectra by using some computer program or other uh, methods. Site response analyzers are three uh, techniques for, uh, have three techniques for uh, calculating experimental, theoretical, and empirical. Uh, we uh, at this study we used a theoretical method uh, including one dimensional two dimensional and three dimensional each of them are sorted also in linear equivalent linear and nonlinear in this study we uh, selected equivalent linear for one dimensional and two dimensional method equivalent linear has uh, some advantages such as um, 
is simple as well as linear and approximately is accurate as well as non-linear. Uh, as well as you know, uh, shear wave velocity is an effective factor in the seismic studies. Uh, when uh, an earthquake occurs, uh, two types of wave uh, propagate. Uh, body wave and surface wave. Body wave includes two, uh, two types of uh, waves, um, shear wave and compression wave. Uh, for uh, geotechnical engineering, shear wave uh, is more important than compression wave. Uh, I have not enough time to uh, go in, deep, uh, in details, so um, <clears throat> I just um, say just title. Um, for uh, seismic and geotechnical engineering, uh, shear wave velocity is an effective factor. Uh, and uh, it has uh, some uh, errors when we are measuring or calculating it um, because of operator uh, errors or matches errors or other. So uh, engineers or scientists tends, uh, tend to uh, uh, calculate or predict the shear wave velocity uh, as accurate as possible. In this study, uh, we use from three important databases uh, for this study, Istanbul Geotechnical Vertical Arrays for our input motions, Istanbul Rapid Response Network, uh, for our bedrock uh, levels and Istanbul Microzonation Project for our soil stage of soil profiles and stations and um, shear wave velocity profiles. In this figure, you can see the location of them in the European site of the Istanbul. I would like to speak our motivation for this study. Istanbul is one of the biggest uh, city in uh, in the world and uh, it is very close to North Anatolian Fault, uh, so it is important to uh, engineers to study uh, a seismic hazard and risk uh, hazard, um, uh, um, seismic risk uh, for this uh, city. Uh, in the last years, um, uh, Turkey has experienced uh, some important average or large magnitude earthquakes. Uh, Gökçeada and Kütahya is uh, two of them, are two of them actually. And we used uh, from uh, these two earthquakes in, uh, as input for our studies, uh, for our study. Um, Kütahya earthquake with magnitude uh, about uh, 5.7 and Gökçeada uh, with magnitude about uh, 6.5. In these figures, you can see the location and epicenter of uh, these um, earthquakes. This, uh, this uh, figure presents a thematic uh, 1D modeling for one station of IRRN stations, um, uh, with, uh, which, um, which is designing with uh, deep soil uh, one-dimensional program and this uh, figure shows two-dimensional uh, two modeling for also another station of IRRN station in east-west direction in uh, 1,250 meters. And this is the procedure uh, which uh, we designed for uh, improving our shear wave velocity values. At the first uh, import, uh, input, um, uh, import inputs to the computer or our uh, numerical codes, calculate random profile of the uh, positive or minus 30% range of each value for each layer, uh, then check up uh, the ws 30 and then check the ws of a bedrock layer and then check the difference between uh, ways between uh, layers and at the end if uh, all of them is okay uh, then the numerical codes uh, will print the, the shear wave velocity for us 
for um, continue for uh, continuing of our uh, analyzing. And the results, uh, this uh, figure shows us a comparison of peak ground acceleration recorded and one dimensional site response analysis calculated based records of autoquake uh, vertical area station of Gukchada earthquake on the ground surface before and after shift wave velocity improving in north south direction. You can see the uh, after improving shear wave velocity, the results get uh, get better, and uh, some of them actually are very good because uh, they uh, they are very close to our uh, Otaku vertical array uh, station, so uh, they have some uh, same bedrock formation. Uh, but uh, some of them are uh, actually some of calculated ones are um, less than um, uh, recorded one uh, because of the simplicity or other errors in the programs or in the process. And in this figure, we can see Comparison of epigrant acceleration values of one dimensional size response analysis calculated for uh, on the records uh, from the auto uh, vertical areas uh, of Gukchadar Street on ground surface after the shear wave velocity uh, revision. Uh, in this figure, uh, we modeled uh, north south directions uh, according to the east west directions shear wave velocity. Uh, you can see in some stations they are same, but uh, in most direction they are different. Uh, so in the European side of Istanbul, we should um, check or uh, in the seismic uh, studies we should check the uh, in a multi-dimensional uh, uh, hazard uh, risks, seismic risks, and in this figure. Um, we want to show comparison of spectral analysis uh, between recorded one-dimensional and two-dimensional analysis for uh, KRTTP station based on the Otaku vertical array because of the Gökçe other earthquake in east-west direction. In this figure, uh, at first you can see uh, there uh, there is a significant difference between spectral acceleration recorded on the ground surface and on the bedrock level so in the uh, actually in all of the irr stations uh, there are a, um, a significant amplification and uh, also you can see uh, the red one is uh, after improvement uh, there is a um, improvement uh, after VS improving in spectral acceleration values. And at this figure, we can see comparison of spectral, anal uh, anal spectral acceleration analysis between recorded and one new analysis using before and after VS uh, revision of car TTP station based on Otaku records in east-west direction by using Kutahya earthquake. Uh, actually, in this uh, figure, also you can see the results get, uh, get better uh, by using, uh, actually, Gökçe Ada model modeling. And at the end, uh, in this figure, we can see the comparison of spectral acceleration analysis between recorded one-dimensional and two-dimensional analysis for ATAIO station based on the records of Otaku station of Gökçada earthquake in east-west direction. You can see in uh, some important periods, uh, the 2D uh, or two-dimensional analysis uh, gives uh, better results than one-dimensional. The red one is two-dimensional, the blue one is recorded, and the uh, green-blue uh, one is the uh, after improving this.
And at the end, uh, in this figure, we can see comparison of two-dimensional site response analysis between various horizontal distance from location of ATA IO station um, by using autogre vertical array station inputs of Gökçe Ada Earthquake in east-west direction. You can see in this figure uh, the blue one is recorded and the red one is um, uh, spectral acceleration values in uh, 750 meters horizontal distance. And this is the best distance for uh, that uh, the results fit better uh, than uh, um, others. Uh, so this is uh, uh, shown us uh, that uh, there is a significant uh, uh, changing in or difference uh, in uh, soil classification in each direction of Istanbul uh, uh, soil layers. And at the end, we concluded spectral acceleration values improved after uh, application of the enhancement process. The two-dimensional site response analysis is more efficient than one-dimensional, as you know. Shear wave velocity values are subject to uncertainty during the measuring or other operation. And at the end, due to the complex classification of the soil layers on the European side of the Istanbul, it is very difficult to establish a relationship between the horizontal distance and the response of the site. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chima. And uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Well, it seems like we don't have any at the moment. If there are questions at the end of the session, we will have another chance to uh, receive them. So thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Yuta Hu from Kyushu University in Japan. Uh, so uh, please uh, share screen and you may start your presentation, sir. Uh, can we see, uh, see my screen now? Yes, we see it fine. Thank you very much. Please proceed. So I will start now. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Yutao Hu from uh, Geo Disaster Prevention Engineering Laboratory in Kyushu University. Uh, today is my pleasure to give the presentation. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, The Deformation of Earthquake Resistance uh, Gravel Tire Chips Mixtures at Strength. Uh, first of all, the background. Uh, the large-scale large -scale earthquake-induced hard uh have caused huge damage to infrastructures worldwide. Uh, one of such hazards, liquefaction, uh, has become much frequent in recent years, uh, especially in Japan. Uh, the two figures show the uh, liquefaction-induced damage of house uh, during the two, uh, 20, uh, 2011 of the Pacific coast of Tohoku earthquake. Uh, and the figure on the right shows the liquefaction-induced settlement of the building uh, during the 2016 Kumamoto earthquakes in Japan. Uh, as we can see, the structures located on unimproved foundation suffered severe settlements and damage due to the liquefaction. Uh, therefore, uh, the huge economic losses caused by liquefaction highlights the importance of taking pre preventive measures to protect buildings and the facilities by limiting ground settlements and lateral expansion. Uh, the, this figure shows uh, an undamaged uh, invalid un bridge on the KQ uh, railway line at Shin Ulao Yasu Station in Japan uh, during the 2000, uh, 2011 earthquake. Uh, 
uh, east, uh, east Coast uh, uh, earthquakes. And many road and railway bridges supported by piles were not damaged, uh, though liquefaction occurred around the piles. And the figures uh, downstairs, should, uh, the figure here shows an, an undamaged fire station, but the road subsidence in front of the fire station, the buildings supported by piles were not damaged. So most of the liquefaction countermeasures like pile foundation were developed for new constructions other than existing infrastructures. And for developing countries, sustainable and cost-effective mitigation measures are urgently needed. Uh, on the other hand, in Japan, uh, the total number of end-of-life tires produced was uh, 86 million, uh, which was near 1 million tons by weight in, in 2020. Assuming these figures uh, provided by the state of, uh, provided by uh, <coughs> JETAMA uh, shows the state of recycling of used tires in Japan as of 2020. Uh, so we can see the 60%, uh, 65% of the uh, waste tires are recycling through thermal way, and only 18% of the uh, waste tires are recycling through uh, use, uh, recycling as uh, materials. The thermal recycling is determined, uh, is determination to the atmosphere because it emits more uh, carbon dioxide than other recycling methods like material recycling. Uh, so uh, the scrap tire uh, tire derived, uh, derived materials, which is called SDTDM, have been utilized as geomaterials in recent years. It's a, uh, this such material has lots of advantages, such as low carbon release, lightweight and vibration absorption capability, and high permeability. Uh, here, here are some previous uh, study uh, regarding on the <coughs> liquefaction prevention uh, pre uh, prevention countermeasure and the uh, scrap tire chips. Uh, the drainage method is one of effective liquefaction countermeasure. Uh, Sasaki, as 1918, analyzed the gravel drains on sandy soil for the generation and dissipation of uh, pore pressures, and the use of vertical drain have proven to be effective in reducing damage to buildings. And the gravel tire chips mixture, which is called GTCM, as an alternative uh, geomaterial, has been introduced by Hadalika in, in 2016. And the using GTCM in the reinforcement layer as a liquefaction countermeasure can lead to the prevention of the liquefaction induced settlements of buildings. Uh, so, GTCM has the potential to replace pure gravel as strength, but a few studies focus on these points. Uh, here comes the objective and method of this research. Uh, in this research, we developed uh, a new uh, liquefaction countermeasure called the GTCM drain, uh, drainage system. The GTCM drain is a kind of prefabricated drain. After the installation of these drains around the pre-existing buildings, when earthquakes happen, the uh, export water pressure can be dissipated through the drains, which leads to the mitigation of liquefaction potential of the road. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the objective of this research is to uh, <clears throat> is to research the deformation characteristics, which has significant influ influence on foundations settling uh, post earthquakes on GDCM drains in improved ground. The method uh, in uh, we use the methods uh, one of one is the model test on one G shaking table and the particle image velocimetry and the motion tracking. Uh, here comes the uh, test design. Uh, this figure shows the shaking table and soil box that are being used in this research to conduct one G shaking table test. Uh, the soil box is one uh, is uh, 1800 millimeters in length, 400 millimeters in weight, and 540 millimeters uh, of, of 40 millimeters in height. Uh, considering the size and the specific of our shaking table, uh, we use the scale, scale ratio of n equal to 33, uh, which are shown uh, in the following tables. <clears throat> The GTCM dress was made were, were made with volumetric gravel fraction of uh, GF equal to 50%, uh, as shown here, and uh, covered with geotextile textile and wear well mesh uh, to uh, to prevent to prevent the sand falling inside. Uh, the trend is uh, 300 millimeters in length and 50 millimeters in diameter. Uh, we choose the uh, volumetric gravel fraction uh, as 50% is because uh, this percentage uh, was found to be the best mix and pick percentages at which the rise in export water pressure to be significantly restrained without compromising the stiffness of the reinforcement inclusion. Uh, the total sand uh, is used as the foundation in this test. The properties of this sand is shown in the table. Uh, this figure shows the layout of the test model in this research. 
the, the, the figure, figure A is the 3D view, and the figure B is the front view, and the, the figure, figure C is the uh, top view. Uh, six vertical GTCM joints uh, around the, uh, uh, along the long sides of the model building, uh, installed from the surface level up to the bottom of the loose sand layer, and extended into the hard layer. Another four GTCM joints uh, inserted at 60 degree, <clears throat> uh, at six, uh, 60 degrees uh, along the short side of the model building. The diameter of this uh, dress is 50 millimeters. Uh, a shallow foundation of a building with a bearing pressure of 3 kPa, uh, represented by a rectangular uh, block of uh, brass material uh, with a cross section area of, of uh, 230 millimeters and 100 millimeters in model scale, is set upon the soil. Uh, in addition, there is a thick layer of gravel with two centimeters in depth uh, between the model building and the GTCM joints. A dynamic loading with acceleration of 200 car, uh, frequency of 4 hertz, and duration of 10 seconds is applied to this model. And several, uh, several pore water pressure uh, transducers are set in the location as showing. Uh, two motion analysis marks uh, are located on uh, two sides of the model building. Uh, this figure shows the settlements of the model building. Uh, as can be shown, uh, as can be seen, uh, the model building suffered a settlements due to the deformation of the loose sand foundation. Uh, and through uh, motion analyze, uh, the time history and the trend of the building settlement are overturned and drawn uh, in this in the figure on the right. <clears throat> As D1, uh, the maximum settlement is uh, 37 points 40, uh, 45 millimeters, whereas the other side, the value is recorded as around uh, 32 millimeters. The rotation due to the uneven settlement was about 1.28 degree. And due to the rotation of the shallow foundation, the upper soil of inclined installed GTCM joints defrost more significant. Uh, and the after deformation foundation surface has a similar shape of the versatility fields of the soil beneath, uh, which we will be uh, showing in the uh, next few, in the uh, next uh, slides. Uh, this slide shows the time history of exporter pressure. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, the uh, recorded by the power of uh, the port pressure. Uh, transducers uh, as, as a benchmark in the shallow layer of the free field with no influence from any trends. Only P4 reached the four in liquefied value of when. Uh, other than that, the RU initiates a speeded increase as the earthquake started and remains in high value until the end of the shaking at P3, P4, and P7, and P8. On the contrary, the RU as P1, P2, P5, and P6, surrounded by GCM trends, remains at a low level. The DCM-CM trends, therefore, did effectively dissipate the export water uh, and make a great effort in preventing liquefaction. Uh, since the liquefaction was not observed beneath the building, the settlement described in the previous uh, slide is assumed to be caused by only the loose, sand, uh, loose soil consolidation. Uh, this figure shows the velocity fields uh, during two cycles of uh, <clears throat> dynamic loadings uh, obtained from the PIV analysis the analyzed area is 400 millimeters uh, multiplied by 70 uh, millimeter. The large velocity are observed in the loose sand layer, uh, loose, sand, loose sand soil foundations accompanied uh, by the <coughs> acceleration of the shaking table. The figure shows the velocity <coughs> field after the shaking table, shaking table reached the acceleration of 200 gar as t equal to nine seconds. Uh, as the shaking continued, the consolidation of the loose sand uh, ground result, results in the settling of the model building. The soil is also found to be pushed uh, upward into the gravel cap uh, layer simultaneously. And this figure uh, shows, uh, as a comparison, uh, shows the velocity fields in a cycle during the post consolidation phase uh, as, t as 60 seconds. Uh, though the large velocities are observed in areas, the foundation rocks much more slightly. Uh, indeed, the velocity under the foundation is negligible compared uh, to the further away. However, due to the rotations of the shallow foundation, the upper soil of inclined installed uh, GTCM deforms significantly. The after deformation foundation surface, on the other hand, has a similar shape of the velocity fields of the soil beneath. So here comes the conclusion. Uh, first, the installation of GTCM joints helped in controlling the increasing of export pressure. And second, with GTCM joints installed, the movement of the deformation of foundations beneath the unsurface structure 
could be limited, uh, especially during the uh, post consolidation phase. And second, uh, uh, and third, the export pressure increased much slower uh, due to the combined effect of uh, drainage and less ground deformation deforming. And the last one, the influence of GDCM drains arrangement to the ground uh, deformation is significant. So to figure out the deformation situ uh, uh, situation beneath the foundation, which could not be observed through model tests, the finite uh, elements method would be used to do numerical simulation in the following research. And thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yuto. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, actually, I have a question. I was curious about uh, your selection for uh, the geometry of your model. So you have uh, some vertical drains and then some inclined drains. Uh, and yeah. it is a, uh, it's not a particularly common application or is it common in Japan? I don't know because uh, normally drilling with an angle is a bit more difficult compared to vertical drilling. So uh, is it common in Japan or why did you uh, choose that to be your geometry? Uh, uh, in the previous research, we have uh, designed only vertical trends uh, without any angles, just vertical strength around the uh, buildings. But uh, we we find that we need to more we need more trend, more trends to uh, achieve the result that we expected. So uh, we try to use inclined trend to uh, replace uh, more vertical trends uh, to make uh, more easier to do the uh, to 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 use this. But uh, technical te te technology in practice. So yeah. this is just a, a new design uh, technology now. Okay, so I I is it significantly more efficient than using vertical drains for the uh, outside the foundation? So I guess we are talking only to surround the foundation, all the peripheral drains. So is it significantly more efficient than vertical drains? Because this is for the uh, existing buildings. So the building is already here. What we can do is install trends around the building. We cannot uh, install trends under the building because of the, fun the building foundation itself. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm saying you, you could, uh, if you compare installing vertical drains outside the foundation area around the building, is it less effective than installing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we need to use more vertical trends to achieve the same uh, Effect, if effectiveness as the inclined trends. That's why we choose inclined right now. Mm, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before moving on to the uh, next presentation, actually, I am going to take the floor to uh, make a announcement slash advertisement. So, uh, a few months from and i i thought this might be uh, relevant to this particular session and its attendees because uh, this is the geotechnical earthquake engineering session so uh, let me share my uh, screen uh, Okay, can, can you see my screen as it is, I suppose so. Uh, so basically, you can, this is also an ISMG endorsed event. It is an international workshop uh, on advances in laboratory testing of liquefiable soils. And if you go through here, you can also find the website. Its website is uh, here. Actually, it's a, a trio of events uh, consecutive one after the other. Uh, so the third one is the International Workshop on Advances in la Laboratory Testing of Liquefiable Soils. Uh, it is organized by uh, TC101, which is the Technical Committee on Laboratory Testing of Soils. So uh, it is in 17th of September this year in North Cyprus as well, in uh, near uh, Girne in the north coast of the island in a, uh, in a uh, resort hotel. And... Uh, the other events might also be interesting uh, if 
uh, if you are interested in those are the national symposium of uh, north cyprus and also the uh, nature inspired solutions for the built environment so uh, i thought this might interest some of the audience uh, okay having said that uh, let me unshare my screen again and uh, so our next uh, presentation is by Piotr uh, Kowalczyk or I hope I pronounced that sufficiently correct but uh, unfortunately he uh, isn't he wasn't uh, able to uh, do this live so instead he were he was able to send a video so he's from uh, I believe from Wroclaw University of Science and Technology in Poland and uh, now we are going to see his uh, video of his presentation next. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Piotr Kowalczyk. I'm an independent researcher, formerly staying at the University of Trento in Italy. And today I would like to present you my work entitled uh, Proposal of a Model Setup for Verification of the Origin of High Frequency Motion in Soil. The outline of my presentation contains, firstly, background to high frequency motion observed in soil. Secondly, I will introduce you very briefly to the general idea of uh, soil unloading elastic waves in the steady state solution. Uh, nextly, I will uh, show you the actual contribution uh, to this conference, which is a proposal of a, num of a perfect model setup analyzed numerically. And then I will conclude with a sort of short summary. So let's begin. To start off, uh, let me introduce you to the typical observations in experimental works. Uh, very often, uh, even though the intended input motion at base of uh, soil specimen is perfectly sinusoidal, the response contains some unexpected high frequency components. And explanations to the presence of such high frequency components uh, included, for example, um, soil fluidization in dry soil or cyclic mobility in uh, saturated soil or even uh, pounding between soil and structural elements. Uh, moreover, experimental imperfections uh, can also be the source of such high frequencies. Let's move on to the introduction of the general idea of existence of uh, soil elastic unloading waves in the steady state response. So the general idea is that as we uh, shake our soil at base with a uh, sinusoidal input motion we do expect that okay there might be some amplification in the motion however we would in general expect that the uh, the computed or the observed frequency at the top of the uh, soil is actually containing only uh, the input uh, frequency this apparently does not always happen and um, often there is a, the actual response contains uh, not, uh, two frequencies uh, being uh, present at the top of the soil, that being uh, uh, the natural frequency of soil in addition to the input frequency. So we could say that the solution in the steady state response is actually a function of the input frequency and the soil natural frequencies, which is then somehow similar to the traditional transient response in, uh, in dynamics. And this is new explanation to high frequency motion observed in soil. It is based on my previous works, firstly on my PhD thesis on general propagation of unloading waves, secondly on my works showing initial consideration and proofs of the potential existence of elastic waves in the steady state solution of a hysteretic soil. Uh, for example, numerical reproduction of the experimental results obtained by DAR can be shown here as uh, a promising proof. Now looking at, the, at a different example, uh, in this case of a structural response, uh, which is apparently affected by uh, unloading elastic waves. Uh, and for the, this purpose, uh, if we look at the system analyzed on the left hand side with five files and a structure placed on uh, three of them, we can observe that both computed and measured uh, accelerations show high frequency motion representative of uh, soil elastic waves um, however in this case uh, we must say that the experimental setup 
contains uh, small has been done in a small uh, soil container to there is a chance that uh, boundary conditions affected the uh, response the soil profile is not really homogeneous and there are also numerous structural elements embedded in soil so there is a, a potential source of uh, additional waves uh, being generated in within this complex system Therefore, uh, my work uh, on this conference uh, is a sort of a proposal of a perfect uh, experimental model setup investigated numerically. So I'll show you now methodology and results uh, of this short numerical study. Moving on to the methodology of uh, the numerical investigation of an imaginary perfect experimental model setup, it is assumed that uh, the flexible soil container is uh, relatively large. For example, it could be 5 meter long and 1 meter high. The input motion is uh, perfectly sinusoidal of a single harmonic of 5 hertz. And the soil is assumed dry, for example, Leighton Buzzard Sand uh, Fraction E. And a simple structure or oscillator of uh, the natural frequency coincident with the so first soil natural frequency in this case around 25 hertz is assumed to be placed at the top of the soil. The numerical study is a simple 2D finite element model containing soil and a structure sitting on, on its top. Uh, the input motion is a perfect uh, sinusoidal input motion of a frequency of 5 hertz. A uh, hypoplastic sand model is used uh, uh, to model soil nonlinearity in a reliable manner, and the model uh, parameters uh, are as shown in the in the presented table. Let's move on to the results. Uh, first of all, if we look at horizontal accelerations, uh, firstly in free field, so far away from uh, the structure, we can observe that high frequency motion of a repetitive uh, pattern in consecutive sine cycles. Uh, can be observed. Similarly, if we look at the response uh, computed on at the top of the oscillator, we can see again that there is a, a repetitive high frequency motion uh, uh, recorded, computed in uh, consecutive sine cycles. If we look at the spectral response of horizontal uh, accelerations, we can see that for free field and uh, for uh, the response computed on and the oscillator, there are some higher frequency components being present in the response. And most importantly, um, we can see increased the amount of uh, the frequency of 25 hertz, which is uh, representative of soil elastic waves. Uh, moreover, the um, high frequency motion does not appear only in uh, accelerations, it also appears in uh, uh, horizontal relative displacements, both in free field far away from the structure and on the top of the oscillator. This leads us to a short summary. I believe that uh, my short numerical study shows that soil elastic waves can apparently be observed in the steady state response of the soil and the structure, therefore uh, sort of confirming the possibility of the release of soil unloading elastic waves and need for uh, the actual experimental evaluation of the numerical findings appears evident uh, to me. Thank you for your attention. In case you have had some questions or a general interest in the topic or even a potential collaboration, uh, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, uh, I can also offer preprints of some of my other works on this topic. Um, these are available on request. Uh, I also can offer uh, example input files uh, using hypoplastic soil model. Uh, thank you again uh, for your attention. Well, uh, even from distance, we thank him uh, for the interesting uh, talk. And uh, so, are there any afterthoughts, any comments, or any uh, questions to uh, the presenters we have had live in this session? Uh, or any other geotechnical earthquake engineering comment here? Uh, Kartal Hocam, 
Can yes, you? Uh, you are going to close this session, and Faiza Hoja is here, and she is going to. Uh, after you, you close the session, she is going to t uh, talk. Ah, okay. So, yes, basically, if there are no other uh, comments from the participants or questions, yes, this has been a uh, an interesting, uh, fruitful uh, session about earthquake engineering and. Uh, uh, I'll just ask: Can we get all the, the present the presenters, uh, including Feza Hoja, on the screen, please? Herkes yala bilir miyiz? Yukarıya kimler varsa. There was also uh, Togani Upomo, did he leave? Some of them might leave, never mind. Uh, uh, Shima, if you take out your hat and we see you, we take uh, uh, one picture at the end of the session as well with uh, Heza Hoca, the chairperson of the conference together with me. So... She is going to speak to you as well after Kartal Hoca uh, uh, closes the session. Kartal Hoca, can uh, yes, I can consider it. Can, can, can we see you? Your camera is closed. I think she is not. I think she is not over there. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. This picture is good as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Andreas. You're okay. <laughs> Is the paper taken, Hojam? Hmm? What? Uh, 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 is the picture, taken? picture, picture. picture. Am, am I taking it? I don't know who is taking the picture. The session, <laughs> the session chair is. Ah, you, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I, 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 thought, I, I thought that director Betulan was taking it. I, I don't know. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, uh, let let me do it. Let let me let me take the screenshot. Let me actually take it full screen and that way. Yes, now I have taken it. Let me let me just check to verify if it is okay, if everybody's eyes are open, etc. Uh, is the session closed or is it continuing? No, it, it is finished, Ojan. It is finished. Thank you, Zaman. Let's try one more. Javit Ojas eyes are eyes were closed. Okay, three, two, one. Yes, now, now everybody looks okay. perfect. Excellent. I cannot open they have to be to be I am not sleeping for the last four nights. Kartal, son dakika da aradık. Çok çok teşekkür ederim. Ne demek hocam? Hocam, if, if, you, if you thank Kartal on behalf of the organization, uh, it's going to be he, look at it. It is going to be watched for YouTube, Hocam. Ha, ben kapandım mı diye onun için sordum. No, no, it's not, it's not. Still, still on. We are still recording. Oh, yes. Um, Professor Kartal Tokyar, I would like to thank you for all your support and contribution to our conference by accepting uh, to act as the chair of the session. And I also would like to thank all the contributors all the presenters of the session. And uh, with those, I think we are moving towards the end of the session and we will have another session after this one, uh, Javit Hocam. And that will be the, our last session. 
And without you, this conference would not be re realized uh, uh, to that to this extent, at least. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, I will say two words as well. Without Feyza Hoca and the Turkish uh, uh, Association of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, this conference wasn't going to be organized. Their help and support is paramount. Thank you all. And without you, it was just impossible. And not only this one, all those five conferences, and we wish you many others, Javit Ojo. This is, we are, we did them together. We are doing them together, Hojam. <laughs> yes. I say the same thing. You say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>